Welcome back to our second 90-minute session. If you have missed the first, you have missed a lot. We had four wonderful speakers, and uh, we'll have three wonderful speakers now. Um, just a, a short kind of briefing of uh, what the first session was about in case you didn't attend. We discussed content of, of encyclopedias and um, looked at uh, very specific case studies, two from Germany, one from Ireland and uh, one from America, an American perspective. So now, in the second session, we want to address new encyclopedias for the digital age. If the previous session explored individual encyclopedias and how each one is an organism in itself, reflecting times, regions, cultures, genres, and its editors, um, now we want to look at possibilities how encyclopedias um, can create the full universe of musical histories, trends, and styles. This session focuses on technology and um, how it can facilitate creating a universe while maintaining the identity of very specific encyclopedias as individual organisms. The forthcoming Rural Music Encyclopedia collection might be such universe bringing together individual works because one should not exist without the other. With this in mind, I hope that we have uh, fruitful discussions after our um, three presentations. Our first speaker is Alvaro Torrente, who is involved in the Diccionario de la Musica Española e Hispanoamérica, and I ask him to give us a brief position statement. Well, I want to start thanking Tina Fruhauf and the organizers of the conference for giving me the opportunity to be here with such a distinguished company and of reference works that I have used for years. And uh, I'm here to talk about this uh, collection of articles, the Diccionario de la Musica Española Hispanoamericana, which was compiled between 1989 and 98, and then published, edited and published in the, in the following years up to 2002. It was compiled by the Instituto Complutense de Ciencias Musicales and the, the publish, funded by the Spanish government and by the Sociedad General de Autores y Editores. Here you have the three logos. It's a long-term partnership between these three organizations. Inspired by the successful models of MGG and uh, New Grove, the project was initiated by three, by three Spanish scholars, Emilio Casares, José López Calo, and Ismael Fernández de la Cuesta, who created a network of 22 directors with responsibility on the contents of 19 American countries. Here are the names of the, con the countries and the country editors in two slides. After a long compilation process, which involved contributions for more than 700 scholars, the final editorial and publication phase was directed by Emilio Casares with the collaboration of the Cuban musicologist Victoria Eli and the Colombian Benjamin Yepes. Um, the result was 10 printed volumes containing Oh, well, these are the international partners who also collaborated in the project, like the Fundación Vicente Emilio Sojo in Venezuela, another organization in Argentina, Chile. So it was a joint project of many institutions and people. It contains more than 26,000 articles in some 10,000 pages, also including more than 5,000 5, images, many of which had never been published before. The number of articles per country certainly reveals a bias in favor of Spanish content. Here you have about 13,000 for Spain, uh, 2,200, nearly 2,300 for Argentina, then going down Mexico, and you see that some countries like Honduras or Panama have a very short number. Uh, the bias is based, of course, on the impulse that came from, the, the, the most of the project was run from Spain, but it also reflects the latest research on music at that time, as no limit was uh, ever established in the limit, of num uh, limit or number of contributions from every country. 
Furthermore, the compilation triggered a significant step forward in music research, since many articles were not based on pre-existing literature, but on primary research, making the dictionary an invaluable reference work for music making in Spanish-speaking countries. Contents covered multiple aspects of music history and practice. Biographies represent by far the largest number of contributions, and in most cases, they were written anew, incorporating detailed catalogs of compositions and writings. Although it was composers who received major attention, biographies also include most known libertist performers and promoters. You can see the number was about 14,000 biographies, which is a very significant uh, number. Particularly relevant are the articles devoted to instruments, with special attention to those used in traditional music in Latin America. Here is, for example, the, uh, the starting of one article about the instrument called Guido, typical for the Caribbean and other countries in Latin America. And you can see, for example, the large number of synonymous, the other names that the, the instrument had in other countries. And if you look below the white area, you see that the article contains entries, individual entries for, related to the cultivation of this instrument in all the countries mentioned there. Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, Ecuador, Salvador, Honduras, Mexico, Panama, República Dominicana, and Venezuela. Interestingly, no articles for most modern orchestra instruments were written, except when they were cultivated in traditional music. Even when, like the violin, its use is documented in Spain from the late 16th century. Here you have the, oh, sorry, this is a picture of the Guido. Here you have the starting of the violin. You see that there's no definition apart from chordophone and starts directly about the violin in Bolivia. No, no study of the violin in Spain, despite we have evidence, as I said, for example, this painting of Velázquez shows from around 1620, the performance, three singers performing with the violin. Also relevant are 800 articles about music institutions including comprehensive reviews of theaters, archives, orchestras, or academies, or the more than 300 dedicated to cities, regions, and countries, providing sometimes for the first time a, a synthesis of music practice in specific territories, uh, to have in specific territories. The Diccionario was certainly a turning point for musicology in Spain and Spanish-speaking countries not only for the richness of its massive content, but also because the gathering of all this information provided the most comprehensive perspective on the cultivation of music in this cultural community. Moreover, the academic collaboration between hundreds of scholars from a number of countries, who in many cases had maintained very little contact with each other, helped to create an embryonic community of Spanish-speaking musicologists, which was to provide further benefits in the following years. Despite the gigantic effort required for a community with a relatively young musicological, musicological tradition, it soon became obvious the need for a revision, and not only because the run of 2,500 uh, copies was sold out in short time. The slow compilation process initiated with the pre-internet communi communication technology implied that many articles were published a decade or more after they were written. Furthermore, the availability in one single collection of such wide gathering of information about music allowed for connections between multiple contributions that changed a number of assumptions implied in isolated articles. For example, we have an article about the city and we have 20, 30 articles about people related to that city. If you read the whole thing, you realize that you have to change the article about the city. But more important than that, in the last two decades, Spain and Latin America have experienced a massive bloom of young musicologists, many of whom were trained in international academic standards, which were often lacking in previous generations, resulting in a massive publication of new research, not to mention the shift in the musicological methodologies and paradigms that changed dramatically the perspective and understanding of music practice in our countries. The online version of New Grove which was extremely successful in both academic and commercial terms, showed the path to be followed. 
Transferring the dictionary to the web would permit to reach three significant goals. First, it would grant the access of the dictionary to a wider academic and non-academic community. Second, it was the best way to initiate the progressive upgrade of contents, because in opposition to a new printed version, which would have required the revision of the whole dictionary step by step, as was done by Macmillan for Grove 7. The online version allows to upgrade slowly, uh, depending on what is more urgent or, or what is uh, easier to accomplish. Third, it would open a new sales channel of existing and new content, allowing to fund the expenses of both the revision and the web publication. In 2010, the Instituto Complutense de Ciencias Musicales, still under the direction of Emilio Casares and the Sociedad General de Autores, initiated a project to transfer the dictionary to the web. The model chosen was to develop a proprietary web platform based on semantic technology, semantic web. We have some sessions in this conference about that, with the collaboration of an external contractor. After three years of work and the investment of substantial sums, the project didn't succeed and had to be cancelled. I cannot summarize here the complex reason for this failure, yet I'd like to stress here the main learning, is that musicologists and academics are not normally equipped with the skills and knowledge required to enter the digital arena. So the project was too ambitious at some times and they couldn't foresee the technological implications, the cost and the complexity of an, an ideal project. So, it has to be cancelled, and we needed to start almost from scratch. Early last year, the board of the Instituto Complutense de Ciencias Musicales appointed me as new director to replace Professor Casares after his retirement. Among my responsibilities was to find a new formula to transfer the Diccionario de la Música Española Hispanoamericana to the net. After the learnings of the first attempt, we are almost ready to start when we will be able to overcome the challenges presented by this project which I would like to summarize here. And they are div divided in four categories. Technology, legal and financial, content and people. And I will s s devote some time to each of these. Technology. The first issue was to decide whether we should develop again our own platform or find it a technological partner. After our first bad experience, I take into account that the content update would already require a massive effort from our side. The second option appeared to be the most suitable. So we started to search for technological partners. One of the main technological challenges was to transfer into logical data visual information contained in the editorial format, which had semantic value. For example, font size, style, indentation of placement in an, in an article has a meaning. We know that because we are scholars, but sometimes the contractors don't. Um, it, I'm sure it sounds obvious, but it is very important in, in this process because the loss of mi or misinterpretation of format, like for example, missing the italics or small caps, would imply substantial editorial revision and therefore increase the cost of the process. Although this may, no, sorry. In fact, this was one of the critical points of the first failing at attempt to digitize the dictionario. The model designed by the contractor to transfer the data was unable to retain some of the format. Beyond the digitizing process, we are searching for a platform meeting two essential requirements. On the one hand, it should include a state-of-the-art web publishing tool with the expected standards of usability, presentation, and search cap capabilities, as well as the flexibility to adapt to future developments, including hyperlinks, uh, multimedia contents, and whatever we can imagine in the future. On the other, it should provide us with a distributed plat editorial platform, a content management system able to support the whole authoring and editorial process, including workflow control in several levels. The next list of challenges are, have to do with legal and financial. Uh, this, in part, has to do with the special circumstances of this dictionary. 
because our, our goal here is to define a frame, framework to conciliate, conciliate the interests of several players. Three of them, I presented at the beginning, who were involved in the printed version are and are still part of the current project. But we have to include uh, one or two more. Uh, one is the copyright, own, copyright owner, which is Sky, Sociedad General de Autores. The production team, which will be coordinated by the Instituto Complutense de Ciencias Musicales. The financial supporter, which we hope to be the same, uh, the Spanish government and the Sky. And then one or two new players, the technological partner and the commercial partner, depending on how we define two or, or just one. The framework involves not only legal matters, but also raising financial resources to fund the initial phase of the project, on the assumption that after a certain point, the commercial exploitation of the platform will provide resources to guarantee the long-term sustainability. We want to be sure that the project will, will not collapse, collapse after the next change of government or when they will cut subsidizing the project. So we need to design a project where, which will make a revenue for the future. About many questions arise about the content. Mm. Some have been discussed more extensively by my colleagues, but I will just mention some of the challenges we have. The first and most obvious is whether we should start publishing the content of the printed version or should we commence, commence with an updated version. I am personally inclined towards the second option, not towards the the first option, because the printed version has already been quoted in thousands of publications, and it will be very useful to find the referred content in the online version. But this is a decision that won't depend only on me, of course. An obvious step will be to revise out-of-date con content. In other words, to kill the dead people. 20 years later, many things have changed, and we have to update that. But the main undertaking is not there. Will be the, to improve the current content where they have proved to be incomplete uh, or insufficient. For example, revise and expand articles on America to compensate the unbalance that I have mentioned before. Complement deficient areas, and uh, I mentioned uh, some about instruments. Instrument is one of the, our strengths, but we still have some gaps that need to be filled. But for example, musical genres, and in general, music terminology, and we are learning from Marcus Bandura and their project, is an area which really needs much improvement. And then, for example, we need to unify the criteria for articles about countries, regions, cities, and even expand to new cities which don't have an article yet, but deserve to have one. But on a different matter, we should take into account that the uses of the platform will include not only the academic community who already uses the paper version, but we hope a wider public of music professionals, students, and aficionados who may have additional expectations. One example would be to provide a systematic lexicographic dictionary with definitions of conventional terms, which we don't have. Another would be to include articles about specific works and masterpieces. For example, when I show uh, a sample of this to one of the uh, managers of Sky, the owner of the copyright, the first thing he wanted to search was Concierto de Aranjuez. And then I realized we don't have any works, not operas, no zarzuelas, no uh, articles about specific works, and I think many of them deserve to be there, if there's a demand, of course. And I'm getting to the end. The fourth issue is about people. If we will be able to overcome all the challenges discussed until here, we will be in the position to design the human team to work in the dictionary content. One of, one of the issues here is whether to create the original, recreate the original network of national directors, but we are more inclined to have regional coordinators because in many matters, current national borders have no influence in the cultivation of musical genres or instruments, and this connects with the comment made by Professor Castello Branco uh, earlier, which I completely agree with, because we have the article widow with uh, eight sub-articles, but maybe we should have a very big article about the Guido, and maybe some complementary contributions from specific countries. Furthermore, we plan to define a matrix structure of content uh, commission, revision and approval, with the coordinators in two levels. On the one hand, we have 
regional coordinators who will overlook about a certain region in, in. And then we, we have other coordinators about specific type of contents, for example, a coordinator on instruments, or a coordinator on musical genres, or a coordinator of, on places. So when an article about a country is written, it's supervised to fill certain conditions, certain requirements that uh, will be more or less uniform. And concluding, negotiating, negotiations are still open, and I cannot tell here when and how we will approach and overcome these challenges. We already have two alternative for technological partner, one of whom is our host in this conference, uh, Realm, Barbara Dov Mackenzie Zdravko, Velakovic, who is here, and the other I'm going to show you, who has proved to be very successful uh, in, in digitizing the content. Imagine that this is based on black and white printed version, and they have been able to do this. Uh, to make a final decision is not in my hands, but in the hands of the people who will run, subsidize the project. But uh, the, the inclination at this moment is that uh, we trust the expertise of Realm providing a, a academic, digital academic content uh, for the music academic community, and we also trust the criteria of Beren Reiter and MGG that have already chosen this platform. So my will is that that will be our, our next uh, step, but this is open to the decision of other people. Thank you very much for your attention. Our next presenter is um Laurence Lütteken, Professor and Chair of Musicology at the University of Zurich and Editor-in-Chief of MGG Online. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, um, I want to make some remarks in the history of the project of MGG Online and then um, if you are expecting really a lot of technological problems, I don't want to bore you with uh, all these uh, facts, but I want to make some general remarks concerning the status of an enterprise like MGG Online uh, with reference to our title, Referencing Music in the 21st uh, Century. And I have to thank, of course, uh, the organizers, especially Tina Fruyov, to invite me. As, re as you remember, MGG has two printed versions, two printed editions. The first one started as early as 1948 and uh, was finished in 1974. Um, editor was uh, Friedrich Blume. And the second one started uh, just 20 years later, 1994, and uh, finished in 2008. Editor was Ludwig Fincher. And um, the um, the, the, it, it, the, the second edition was planned at first, so its uh, digital age avant la, avant la lettre was planned as a simply revised version of the first printed edition and has completely changed. It's a new, uh, it's a new, completely new version. It was a commercial product by uh, first uh, one, uh, one publishing house, Bärenreiter and Kassel, and the second version by two publishing houses, Bärenreiter and Kassel and Metzler in Stuttgart. Um, the first discussions on a digital edition started 15 years ago, um, but uh, two years, just two years ago, uh, the idea of a, of a third uh, a digital edition was uh, planned based on the second printed version. It's a, this enterprise is a collaboration between the two responsible publishing houses from, for the printed edition, Bärenreiter in Kassel and Metzler in Stuttgart, uh, responsible at least for all questions of content, and Rilm here in New York, responsible for the very uh, difficult technical developments and uh, questions. Um, now works have started since yeah, nearly two years, and um, 
I don't want to 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 present you no. Uh, I don't want to present you uh, details of this work. But uh, if you are interested in it, um, uh, the project is de uh, presented more detailed. Will be presented more detailed during the AMS uh, in November in Louisville. Uh, so there is the possibility to learn a little bit more uh, concerning the the um, the, the structure. Um, a few days ago, on June the 1st, one of the leading German media experts, Lutz Hachmeister, has published a remarkable article in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. This article deals with a fundamental critic of the idea of a digital society. He refers to an analysis of Nicolas Negroponte. Negroponte has proclaimed as early as 1998 in the magazine Wired, here in New York, the end of the digital revolution. He criticizes, in his own words, the materialistic idea of a self-regulative internet of a global network producing its own form of knowledge and society. What Negroponte criticizes nearly 20 years ago is now our everyday life. Especially uh, 20 years later is now our everyday life, especially in the reality of postmodern universities, even of the smallest, one, smallest ones. Completely av av complete availability of all aspects of knowledge without any limits. That means normally, in the first step, transmission to all the existing, of all the existing materials into digital structures. But there are further implications. Free availability with radical open access, therefore without any costs for the user. Laded by a fundamental trust in the regulatory mechanisms of the technology itself. A clear practice of addition that means endless and at a certain point infinite processes of the summation of knowledge. No regulative borders in quantity and quality. No clear textual, that means linear structures, no recognizable, recognizable limits. Of course, all this is an illusion with a fundamental contradiction to reality. If, for example, one of the product protagonists of the digital era has horrible toothache, he is expecting a real doctor with real experience producing a precise and successful resection of his root. And of course, by no means with open access, therefore without a bill. But as Hachmeister complains, the scientific dogma is nearly untouched by this reality. A mirror of these procedures, we had it just before, uh, seems to be the world of Wikipedia, with its numerous and enormous files. These structures are not only formats produced by a hypertext system, for example, in the same way as PowerPoint is dominating the structure and reality of scientific presentations. The Wikipedia world is rather leaded by the idea, of course, underlined by stochastic implications, that knowledge could be generated by itself in a process without temporal and material limits. That means that the responsibility of the acting individual plays nearly no further role the individual is disappearing. So not only the structures of knowledge should be fixed in the, this process, but knowledge in general. That means, for example, that the article Star Trek, with all its derivates and under articles, has much more uh, volume, for example, than the article Mozart. The user determines the form of the product, and he does it anonymous and without any consequences for himself. The rules are virtual highly dominated by the, by the actual state of political correctness. The play is based on a virtual dialogue with virtual and at least nameless partners. The model could be declined down to the bottom, for example, to the university professor writing his own Wikipedia article, which is a perfect circle. The critic formulated by Hachmeister is concentrated on this main problem the elimination of the acting individual from the production of knowledge. If this is the general feature of the digital era, and it seems that it is like it is, then you have to consider fundamental changes with our dealing with music. But if you are convinced that knowledge is, even or especially in the case, case of music, is not just a stochastic product, of, to, uh, uh, a product you have to, oppos to opposite to this habitus. But that means, by no way, the rejection of the digital technology, but its use, maybe with higher and clearer responsibility. In the case of MDG, you can see this process over a long time. 
There are the, remained, uh, the mentioned existing two printed versions uh, produced between uh, 49 and 2008, and these versions are demonstrating that the construction of knowledge is at a certain point a process. But you can recognize clear principles of this process. Individual authorship with clear responsibilities. Very clear and elaborated mechanisms of proof and regulation. Hierarchical processes of order, clear contexts, clear limits in quality and in quantity. All these features should be now transformed into an online version by using the advantages, of course, of the media, media reality in structure in reflecting the process character and the multi-faced surface. So one main feature is that all forms of responsibility must be clear recognizable concerning the author, the editors, the mechanisms of control. Some, in further times, normative regulations are now obsolete, especially, for example, in the question of limits. But that cannot mean to give up any form of limitation. You need, especially in, in an online encyclopedia, clear, limitation, clear limitations strictly produced and visible for all users. Because it's important for the, for the, for the status of the knowledge you produce. The order of knowledge cannot mean the endless reproduction of all, th uh, of all things you can, now, you can know. This would be a trivial duplication of positive, positivistic age. The order is a clear decision made by specialists to help all people who are not specialists in a specific field or in general. On, uh, a very simple example can demonstrate this feature. A bibliography in an article should not be complete, but should give a first and clear orientation. If you need a full reference, you have other ways, for example, room, uh, but you don't need it because you want to have a clear decision what is, for the first step, really important and what not. Or, a second example, the Brahms article should not add everything you can know, but you should give a clear orientation with high responsibility, with a lot of controls, Controls by authors, by board members, by redactors, and by editors. For this reason, you need a clear control of changes from the first to the second, and then to the online edition. What means that the printed edition should be available online too. In this process, you have to solve a lot of technological problems concerning conversion, structure, platform, surface, and so on. It would be too far here to demonstrate all the complex details. But you have to be aware in producing a technology making the formats of thinking. MGG Online should be a media in helping to create individual formats and not a media in itself. You have to solve further problems because there is no longer an alphabetical order. Of course, no difference between Sachteil and Personenteil. No clear limitation concerning work lists or illustrations. You have to solve the problem of web links because nobody at the moment has a plausible idea of the stability of web links and of really long-term web archives and the costs they produce. But one thing can be said even today, these costs for such archives are enormous and in any case much higher than in the Gutenberg galaxy of yesterday. Things have changed and MGG now can relatively easily react. One very interesting point is, for example, popular music, of course, which can be added now more, much more extensive than in the printed versions. And here you can see the problems with specific clearness. An encyclopedia article in this field should produce knowledge completely different from normal web knowledge from Wikipedia down or up to fan sites. You can add, in any case, more living persons, full work lists, and much more illustrations, if it is possible, by questions of copyright and so on. But the main goal seems to me very clear. In the digital world, which may be not a digital society of digital natives, in the digital world, in the digital world which is a society with its own mechanisms and technologies of producing knowledge, in this world, an online encyclopedia should be an instrument for the controlled production of knowledge, even and especially in the case of music. And this may be the real new quality of an enterprise like MGG Online. 
This aspect is linked with the, least, with, with the last fundamental characteristic, with the illusion of open access. Not just by trivial, reason, by trivial reasons. That means, for example, in the Italian restaurant, you normally don't have open access to your pizza margarita. But for reasons of responsibility, the production of knowledge is expensive. And it's an illusion to, 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 to accept it not. And this is normal in the humanities, and, 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 and it is at least much cheaper than in the sciences, but it's regular and it's normal. And to, to stress this point is a form of seriousness, a form of self-consciousness, maybe a form of, um, uh, of self-consciousness of the humanities in general, especially in our world of music in which just a very small part is of a real commercial interest. The illusion of open access is as senseless as it is the illusion of a digital society. Our main interest in the epoch of digital humanities should not be the supposed complete availability of supposed knowledge, but a world of responsible, controlled, and disciplinary based production of knowledge under the technolo technological realities of the 21st century. Thank you very much. Our final presenter is Annelise Santella from Grove Online. I'd like to add to the accumulating thanks to Tina and to Milena and everyone who organized this panel. It's been a privilege to uh, feel like I have some company in this crazy venture. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, take a slightly different tack, but I think address some of the questions that have already been raised today, um, looking at a couple of aspects of Grove's history, but focusing on the last 14 years of uh, Grove's time online. Uh, the introduction to the first American supplement to the second edition of Grove's Dictionary of Music and Musicians, which was published in 1920, contains my favorite sentence in all of the introductions to Grove editions, which is saying something. The editors are assessing the volume they have just produced and write. After prolonged consultation, the working plan adopted was recognized as not so much a council of perfection as a frank adjustment of ideals to what was practical within the limits of time, space, and scope proposed. I first read this sentence shortly after we sent Amerigrove to the printers and uh, only to be hit with a huge spate of obituaries that meant that my text was already out of date and it, it kind of hit home. A frank adjustment of ideals is perhaps the truest description of the process of editing an encyclopedia that I've ever read. I love it for its honesty. Creating a large and comprehensive scholarly work inevitably forces you to confront limitations of, of all kinds, including your own. It is nothing if not humbling. Defining what is to be included, who will write it, how the content is to be organized, categorized, connected, and displayed so readers can use it for multiple purposes is a gargantuan task that you've already heard some examples of today. Even as you strive for perfection, compromise is unavoidable as you try to match the content with its users via the technology of the medium through which it is delivered. Waldo Selden Pratt and Charles Boyd, the editors of the 1920 American Supplement, were faced with the limitations of the printed book that articles had to appear in a particular order, that the single volume could only accommodate so many pages, that images could only be published on inserted plates, and as this process was expensive, could not be very numerous, that it could only be updated all at once. Making music audible was not a possibility they could even entertain. In the era of online research, our technologies are more forgiving, but they are still not limit limitless. Pratt and Boyd found the model they'd been given, the second edition of Grove, published between 1904 and 1910, insufficient. They wanted not only to make the articles easy to find, but also to present a picture of the history of American music developing across time. They bridged these dual needs by creating a dictionary in two parts. One, comprehensive and organized alphabetically, like a traditional encyclopedia. The other, featuring biographies determined to be most representative of their period, organized chronologically and interspersed with long articles on key eras in American musical history. An elaborate system of cross-references unified the two sections and avoided that, uh, the need for articles to appear in both parts. The result was, as the editorial introduction indicates, not entirely satisfactory, and yet in refusing to be limited by the organizing structures of its precedents, the editors of the first American supplement were remarkably prescient. 
The need to find information through more than one point of entry is an issue we continue to wrestle with in the age of digital publishing. If anything, the problem is even more pronounced as digital access has expanded our reach. The ways in which our technologies have evolved were influenced by experiments just like this one. The new Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians made its online debut as Grove Music Online in January of 2001, simultaneously with the release of the 29 volumes of its second print edition, the seventh in its long history. That same month, another encyclopedia we have heard referenced several times today also went online for the first time, Wikipedia. They're exactly the same age. Grove made the bigger splash. Wikipedia's debut was at first fairly quiet, but Grove's debut was widely reviewed in music journals as well as in the mainstream press. While some critics were optimistic about the new possibilities of the online version, others were frustrated by the limitations of Grove's first platform. Much like the editors of the first American supplement, the critics weren't sure if the experiment was entirely successful. In the case of Grove Music Online, much of the anxiety was directed at the technology itself and the way in which it interacted with the content. The biggest concerns were not with the actual change in delivery model from paper to computer screen, but in what that change suggested about what matters most to us about scholarship. Some were worried that the online format represented, if not the death of carefully maintained scholarly oversight, at least the onset of its decay. In a review in the Musical Times for the summer of 2001, its publisher, conductor and music scholar Peter Phillips, raised a string of questions about the impact of the online format on the content and quality of the dictionary. Do people read long analytical articles on screen? What happens to articles which are replaced? Will they simply disappear overnight, never to be seen again? Or endlessly modified so that what once had scholarly integrity becomes a patchwork, death by a thousand updates? I think that's going on my tombstone. Phillips also asked an important question about the role of the dictionary in general. Should Grove merely reflect the state of musicology, or should it also attempt to influence the future course of scholarship? This last one is maybe the most critical because its answer defines the work that we do. What is the role of the encyclopedia in the digital age? 14 years on, we are still asking and responding to these questions. At Grove, we've been thinking even more than usual about these issues in recent months as we are in the process of building a new website to house the dictionary. Designing the new site has involved thinking seriously about who uses Grove and why, what they want to see and what they do not, and how Grove works together with other resources, both online and in other formats, to build scholarship. And most importantly, it has made us consider how Grove Music Online represents what we as music scholars value in our scholarly work, what we are as a discipline, and where we are headed next. Despite our current focus on very me mechanical and practical details on the way the technology of the new site works, we're currently up to our elbows in taxonomy codes and data models, the technological object of the site is less of a focus than the role as its place where the audience encounters the content. In the remainder of my time today, I'd like to revisit Phillips' questions as a way to consider the point where technology intersects with scholarship and the role digital encyclopedias can play in, de in defining what we do as a field. Philip's first question was, do people read long analytical articles on screen? The short answer is yes. We can demonstrate this with usage stats, which is one of the great resources attached to uh, digital publishing. One, uh, our, we know that our most viewed articles are among our longest. But behind Phillips's question lies a broader concern. Do those who use the online version of Grove read it in the same way that they do print? And the answer to that is almost certainly no. Several recent studies in the field of cognitive psychology suggest that we're not so good at dealing with the facts, at least not uh, that we read online as much as we are on paper. And for researchers, the experience is perhaps especially different. In print, readers have to read through pages to find what they're looking for, passing by other articles on the way. Online, that is not necessarily the case, at least not if your search engine is working right. In the online environment, we have come to expect keywords to take us exactly where we want to go. We don't have to look around. There's something gained here, certainly an efficient arrival at an answer, but there's also something lost. The things you stumble on along the way, the articles alongside the one you're looking for that you didn't know would interest you until you saw it. One of the challenges of the new digital encyclopedia then is how to encourage readers to stay and explore, not just to find what they think they need and leave. There are a number of ways in which we can do this, designing a search experience that presents results in a way that helps people looking for a quick answer find what they need, but at the same time suggests other possibilities for study. Designing tools as entry points that help people learn how to explore and make them want to. And improving the ways we link resources together. If any of you saw Elaine Sisman's paper yesterday in which she traced a, a path of one of her own explorations, you have an idea of what I'm talking about. 
uh, that it's important to present these tools, make it possible, and also that the people who are designing this kind of experience for the website have some understanding of what creative scholarship looks like. Philip's next questions are connected, so I'm gonna handle them together. What happens to articles which are replaced? Will they simply disappear, or will they be endlessly modified? In asking these questions, Phillips is fo focusing on the single biggest difference between print and online, the ability to update at will, or virtually at will, within the limitations of your platform. Updating is the biggest part of the project of Grove Music Online. It's what we spend the most time on, and we work on it every single day. This is also the issue where Wikipedia and Grove most diverge. In crowdsourcing unsigned articles, Wikipedia relies on the belief that with enough people watching, the truth will out. Grove has retained the traditional and more time-consuming process honed in years of print publishing, of commissioning articles signed by their authors and submitting them for review, believing that our authority relies in part on the transparency of provenance and point of view and the oversight of people we trust. The two approaches serve different purposes, as do the two publications. Even as we continue to improve the rate at which we update, something our new platform I think will make possible will be updating monthly instead of three times a year. The editorial board and staff of Grove remain committed to this review process. The third part of this question is the crux of the matter. In the online environment, the concept of the edition is murky. Our editor-in-chief, Dean Root, has referred to, the Grove Music, to Grove Music Online as the eighth edition of Grove, but if you update continuously, how do you know when your edition is complete? Does it matter? Is the very notion of an encyclopedia edition a relic of a print, print era? Our editorial board has done some thinking about this, and we do think it matters. We don't consider the edition to be a relic, but we think the profile has changed somewhat. Editions provide a type of oversight and curation, intellectual organization, that is not addressed in article by article updating alone, and focused work on, edi on edition creates urgency around a project, unifies a community of those working on it, and helps give their work structure. Some types of scholarly development happen best when a lot of people are working on the same thing together. In Grove Music Online, we have been creating micro editions, if you will, topical pro uh, projects with, uh, within the content of Grove that we undertake with subject specialists. We've been conducting these in a variety of formats, working with scholarly societies, with editors we bring in ourselves, publishing both online and in print. One of our current projects is an update of articles on the music of East Central and Southeast Europe under the direction of musicologist Jim Sampson. This part of our content was originally planned as part of New Grove One, which came out in 1980, was revised for the second edition of New Grove. But given the dramatic political changes in that region since that time, it was in need of total rethinking and not just a piece by piece revision. So we brought in area experts to help us with that process. And in working on it this, in this particular way, we've learned that it helps us work very efficiently because we have all the experts we need at hand. So helping us to make those important connections between articles, get things reviewed, all of that gets done in a large chunk instead of having to handle it piecemeal. Phillips's other concern with article by article updating was display, specifically what happens to the old articles. In the days of print, consulting earlier editions was a simple, if cumbersome, task. You just found the first edition of the book. Online, the process of dealing with previous versions of articles is far from standardized across publications. And Grove has some peculiar problems when it comes to versions because of the ways in which articles over time have appeared with major changes in various spin-off publications under various publishers. But we save everything. You can access alternate versions of an article through the current version currently, and you will be able to do so with a, a little bit more ease and uh, information on the new platform. It's an important part of making our, our history accessible, and it's one of the advantages of online. In some cases, we have several different articles on the same subject, and this is one where I think we vary from probably everyone else here. Uh, for example, the article on Arnold Schoenberg that was written uh, by Sabine Feist for Amerigrove recently is quite different from the main article in GMO. Uh, the main article is, is much more comprehensive. The, the article from Amerigo focuses on his time in the United States. We think they're both valuable to researchers of Schoenberg, so they will both appear online. This represents a huge change in the concept of an encyclopedia. It's one that puts, we think, puts resources, more resources in the hands of the readers. It's good for experienced scholars because they get not just facts, but multiple points of view but it can be challenging for those newer to the subject or who are just looking for a quick answer or the best place to start their research. It puts a lot of pressure on our search engine and on our site design, and sometimes on librarians, we're sorry about that, uh, for, to help students find the best article that's suited for, for entry. 
Phillips's final and most critical question was not specifically digital, but more about the role of the encyclopedia itself. Should Grove merely reflect the state of musicology, or should it also attempt to influence the future course of scholarship? The editorial board and I feel strongly that it should do both. This is both an issue of content scope and of access. With regards to scope, it requires that both commissioning articles that cover areas of the field and approaches to them that are well established, but also that we seek out areas that are developing in order to pro provide a place for scholars to explore new territory, bringing together new ideas and sources in hopes that future scholars will find them and do even more with them. It also requires that we actively and regularly scan our existing content for possible historical biases that are embedded in the, in the content that we already have and consider ways to address it. Uh, for example, we're looking, working now on a project to update coverage of women uh, musicians in particular um, and are looking not just at how, what articles to add but also the ways in which these, this area has been commissioned in, a pa in the past that we need to adjust in order to, to include them. As a dictionary with a title that does not qualify its definition of music by geography or genre or gender, we have a responsibility to, pres to present a global view of music. Most of our current commissioning projects, including the re recent pub print publications, Amerigrove and the Instruments Dictionary, are focused on better representing music and including more authors from outside the Western world and outside the field of art music. This is not at the neglect of the, current, of the core content through which it began, however. Whether we mean to or not, the choices we make in our commissioning imply weight and imply value, and it is our responsibility as scholars to take that seriously and act accordingly. Broadening our commissioning also has implications for access. We've learned as we work to increase the representation of international authors in Grove that just because a publication is digital doesn't mean that everyone can get to it. And yet the work we do has a price tag, as has already been mentioned, one that is considerably higher than the all-volunteer labor uh, on that that Wikipedia takes advantage of. We have to work to expand access in a way that allows us to sustain our work. We already offer significant discounts and free access in some regions through our developing, developing countries initiative. And in fact, we offer free access to Wikipedia editors to make sure that they're getting reliable information about the subject that matters most to us. We're currently working on a discounting plan to help the growing class of music scholars without institutional access. Developments in digital research are the natural trajectory of innovations and inquiries begun in print and essential concepts in scholarship. We still need editorial oversight. We still need to listen and respond to audience needs. We still need to help people gain access to what they need. We still believe integrity and access are of paramount importance. But digital tools have changed how much we can do and how far we can reach, allowing encyclopedias not just to follow but to lead scholarship. And I find that profoundly encouraging. Thanks. Thank you very much to our second round of speakers. Um, now the floor is open for questions. If you do have a question, please identify yourself by name and possibly institution. Marlena. Um, it's not every day that when you have a dream, you have the chance to materialize it as I have seen mine this morning. Thank you, Regina Kripal. When I was invited to chair the IMS program committee, one of the first thoughts I had, which I shared with the article, was I would like to organize a private session of reference works, having been not only, you know, taught them all my life, but also because there, I always saw certain problems. Um, and so I want to thank you so much for organizing it so well. And here I am sitting, looking at my dream, just, just <laughs> realized, you know, it's like this. So I want to follow up on what uh, Professor Albert Shalom and Philo Branco, uh, whom I admire so much, and uh, finally we uh, meet here, on the question of what is my next dream. And uh, let's see what, what is possible. Maybe that dream is that you all start talking to each other. Because what I want, and forgive me for being self-indulgent, but I am so old now that it's, uh, you know, <laughs> right? Um, it's permissible. 
when I used to look up contra dance in Stanley's 1980 version of the New Grove, it was all the European contra dance. Beautiful. Then I go more recently to the Diccionario de la Música Española y Hispanoamericana, now in the hands of Alvaro Torrente. And what I see for contra dance is a list of terms where the terminus and the degree have nothing to do with what they did in Europe for Trinidad and, uh, and uh, Argentina and Cuba and Honduras. In other words, that in the new growth, the life of the contra dance ends when the form loses its viability in Europe. Then it goes to somewhere else, in my case of the Americas, and it assumes, morphs into any number of other manifestations, which are sometimes retaining the values, sometimes returning the degree. So in uh, Martinique, you know, you have contradances that retain, I don't know, remains of the day from what it was in Europe. In Argentina, it's called La Media Cana, no? Yeah, they gone, the national dance. So we have this muda on so many, so many uh, genres, forms, uh, concepts. And, and I would like to see other encyclopedias consider this, this, you know, disconnect that maybe is still there. Because if these, my Tele from Martinique or my Medecana from Argentina, uh, are put under ethnomusicology and not under the same concept of what happens in you know, Ireland and then it goes to London and then it goes to Paris and, and, and when it comes to the Americas, it's appropriated and works. Um, it's not the same value for the reader. Not even a link. I want the whole thing there. So that's just one one thought that that maybe now with the possibility of, of this incredible, I'm so grateful to Professor Lutikin for saying that uh, the, the authority should not die with the French versions of things. Um, I think that the communication between the different uh, editorial criteria and different problems, you know, uh, editorial criteria should be culture, culture specific. At what level of the editorial criteria do you, can you uh, impose certain, you know, practical decisions without disturbing culture-specific criteria. In the case of Latin America, and uh, I'm sure Salva would, would agree, terminology, that is just a huge Pandora's box that requires different criteria than what you do with the same melody. Thank you so much for your contribution. For those of you who are not uh, familiar with Malena Kuss's work, she should have been part of this panel because she um, is the mastermind of a fantastic encyclopedia titled Music in Latin America and the Caribbean, and this is where her expertise lies. Um, I actually would like to invite uh, Harry White to make a comment um, and kind of indirectly respond to a lot of the kind of um, ideas we just heard because in Harry White's encyclopedia, the um, idea of the region, the world in relation to, um, to music in or off Ireland has been fabulously dealt with as I think, and I think we can learn something from this, if you may. Thank you, Tina. I'm delighted to respond to the latest comments. But also, in, in general, I mean, I'm very struck by the fact that of the uh, pictures here, there are only 
uh, two English language uh, reference works uh, on this table, which I think is a fantastic inversion of the normal status quo, uh, which is to assume that English is the language of scholarly debate, uh, with the sovereign exception of Spanish and German. But English is so global now that it's become almost terrifying to think that unless something is in English, the, the chances of its circulation, you can be lured into believing this. And it's simply not true. I mean, uh, in my case, for example, it would have been inconceivable. I I'm slightly ashamed to say this, but it would have been inconceivable to publish our encyclopedia in Irish, in, in Gaelic, as Americans say, in, in, in the Irish language, simply because its readership would have been so abysmally small that the enterprise of all that research would not be justified by the uh, minority language status of that of that noble but long deserted tongue. Now, with regard to um, Milena's point, I think the most important thing really is that the enterprise of music research, whether it's um, emancipating a term like country dance from a restricted colonial point of view and allowing it to travel easily into other parts of the world where its semantic meaning and its musicological meaning are immediately filled up anew and afresh, or unhooking ourselves from a, the one thing I think is it's not lacking in this panel but is less visible than it ought to be, which is the, the historicism of encyclopedias. I mentioned in my own piece Rousseau, but I mean I think that there is something characteristically Western about this notion of colonizing information in the way people have done in encyclopedias from the outset. And in fact, primarily perhaps with the new Grove. It's never quite as prominently represented with MGG, but Grove itself, the first edition of Grove, is quintessentially a kind of Victorian Darwinism. It's a way of mapping the musical world. And to some extent, MGG does the same thing, but Grove gets there first, as it were. Now, in our age, we're embarked on a not unrelated quest, which is why I wanted to stand up and applaud when Professor Lutkins made the point that, as I had also made, but in a different way in my paper, that if we don't watch out, the enchantment with information itself, the sheer rapture of that engagement, will overtake the point of scholarship in the first place. Because the idea of an individuated scholarship, whether you're talking about music in the Caribbean or the dynamics of you know, political representation in Ireland or wherever in the globe, it, it, the individual act of scholarship it seems to me is the only thing that makes this worthwhile. And with all respect to Wikipedia, w Wikipedia is not about the authority of scholarship. It's about something else. And even though you can't ignore it, it is about something else. It's about something else than the sum of what we are invested in here today. So I do think that that, um, with regard to individual agencies, each person coming forward and saying, I work in this, I work in that. We're all involved in music research reference in some way or another. I think that that, in fact, is the most important and, and urgent question that uh, hangs over us today. And I don't wish to ignore the point that Tina actually asked me to speak about, but I, I do feel an extraordinary urgency about that. The sheer lust for information has put us into a dangerous place, and I do think we need to take account of it because there is a difference between simply generating more and more guides, companions, encyclopedias, dictionaries, handbooks, you name it, and the quest of the scholar. And I think that the overlap between those two things is something we need to pay more attention to. Sorry, I haven't answered your question, but I felt urged to say this. Don't worry about this, because Hans Werner Heister has offered to <laughs> continue, so. Only a little bit, uh, a little bit of utopia of global equality may be the Gal Encyclopedia of World Music, because there is a strange, um, it, it's, um, odd, um, it's ordered, um, each country, and it's a little bit strange, as your uh, encyclopedia, um, it's a little bit strange to read Europe divided in countries, and Europe the same matrix as for Venezuela or um, uh, Jamaica and so on. That may, may be, not all articles are on the same level, but it's in, in every uh, lexicon the same. Maybe in this way, um, we could uh, make real progresses. The, the um, language problem I mentioned and you mentioned it, um, perhaps we must uh, be accustomed to uh, at least to 
uh, to know that there are encyclopedias in Chinese, in Hindi, in Urdu, in Arabian, and not only in the European world languages as Spanish and English, German is not a long word language. Okay. I have a question for um, Annalisa Santella, but maybe it's not a question, it's a request. After 14 years of growth online, what kind of advice do you have for Alvaro Torrente and Lawrence Lütteken? Oh, or uh, advice in the plural? Do it not, maybe. That's, yeah, yeah, <laughs> get out while the getting's good. Um, I don't <laughs> um, Too late. I, Too late. Wow, that's a huge question. Um, and I'm very mired in this issue from my own perspective at the moment. But I think that never let how people are using the dictionary get out of your sight. I would say that's my biggest piece of advice. You have to think about all of the different ways that people are using it. The people, librarians who are looking stuff up or cataloging, people, students who are encountering this material for the first time. And make sure you understand what it looks like to them. I think that's probably our biggest issue. Mm -hmm. And drink a lot of coffee. Short question about, because I remember talking to a vice president of Ox uh, Oxford University Press about, to, sorry, it's about money. <laughs> Someone raised that question and, and profitability is crucial for, at least for our projects because we need not to depend, we need to depend on the income. I remember talking to a vice president of Oxford, uh, I don't remember the name, but I will tell you, in 2006, and what she said is that New Grove Online was at that time extremely profitable. Have you, can you make a summary of, if that's not confidential? <laughs> I mean, are you struggling uh, now? So is it income going down because of Wikipedia, or you have found a way to complement? They don't actually trust me with too many of the details of the budget for which I'm grateful. But uh, for the most part, yes, it is still retaining prof uh, profitability. And I know that our subscriptions have increased over the last several years for the first time in quite a while. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I, can I just Please. make one point with regard to money and online and so on? Um, the Cambridge University Press publishes uh, the Dictionary of Irish Biography, which is a f fairly recent uh, enterprise. And for, I sit on the board of that uh, dictionary, and they make vastly more money from their online subscriptions than they do from hard copies. But the interesting thing there is that their copy is somehow set in stone. That, in other words, like the Dictionary of National Biography in Britain, the, the, the rules for inclusion are you have to be dead, and it makes it easier, therefore, to somehow control the content, <laughs> but the content is online. And when it comes to making money, and it would be naive to pretend that there is an element of business involved, online is the way to go in terms of publishing, as far as I can see. Yeah, for one thing, the overhead is lower. I mean, it costs us a great deal more to publish. We, we never make money on books, I don't think. I mean, at least not on the kind of books we do in reference. Um, something like Amarigrove or, or the Dictionary of Musical Instruments is, is very expensive to produce. But there are advantages to doing them anyway, because we get attention for them. They get reviewed in a way that online sites do not, and that helps bring people to the site. So all of it has to be sort of considered together. It also is a way of sort of mobilizing forces. Uh, there's something about a print edition that still gets authors excited in a way that it can be hard to say, hey, can you review that article for us that you wrote five years ago? That's harder, a harder sell sometimes. <laughs> I'm neglecting my audience, please. And identify yourself, please, before speaking. Hi, I'm Suzanne Lovejoy from the Yale Music Library. Um, I wonder if any of our online encyclopedias will help us address the problem of locating 19th and 20th century sources, uh, since uh, RISM doesn't go into that area. Um, and I, I want to commend the Dizionario for you know, citing Mexican manuscripts. And I, I really pull that out and show it to people, because I know so little about Latin America or Hispano-America myself, but I just find it a wonderful resource uh, for sources as well as basic information. And um, of course, MGG and, and Grove do many wonderful things, but I find this gap. You know, you're reading about an important 20th century composer, and there's not a reference to where s some of the manuscripts might be, or the, the single manuscripts that are very dispersed, or things like that. 
I believe it's 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 really in, the question is is not so easy to answer because um, in the in the the younger the repertory is, uh, the more unstable are the things. And uh, we I, I know we had for example long discussions on on the on the practice of of, of linking, and uh, I, I remember yesterday. There was a uh, there was here a panel um, discussing the possibilities of, uh, for example, of of a collection of links and so on, and um, for, for for example, for for in the case of of uh, um, manuscripts and so on, you need uh, you need at least stable links, and it's a permanent pro and permanent and intensive process to control it. So putting all links together, then you have a you have a collapse of uh, not, of links not in function. So if you want to really to show, for example, manuscripts and so, you need really a stable a stable thing because otherwise the 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 whole uh, the whole project is collapsing. And this is and I believe it's a question of experience. Nobody knows. Uh, there there have been some. Uh, efforts to 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 collect uh, portals for stable links and so on, but all of them are not really successful because the the things are changing so much, even in the libraries themselves. No? So I believe it's a, it's a, it's very it's it's not easy to to find a solution uh, for that. For example, you have very stable like Beethoven, so you have very extremely stable links where you can presume that they are existing even in 20 years or so. But some of them are, it's, it's, and, and it's in the question of, of sources, I believe it's really, it's a little bit open, open game at the moment. If I could add for Grove, I think uh, I mean, there are other types of linking that you can do that aren't to online sites, just referring to archives yeah. and things in the bibliography as well. But um, Grove for a long time had a policy against talking about those things because the idea was that the philosophy of the bibliographies was to focus on things that were easily accessible by whoever encountered the article. I think that role has changed in the online world as, yeah. as it becomes more, as, as we see, th we, it's so easy to get to many types of information and other things are more hidden that, are, that may be equally useful and or even more so. And, and one of the jobs that we have ahead of us is trying to help, help match people with those types of sources. So it does require a, a sort of a rethinking of what our job is, I think, as, as an encyclopedia. In the case of the Dictionario, the rule was to put information about where the sources, the actual manuscripts or printed versions were preserved, but I'm not sure whether that has been kept in all the in all the editions. And whether to make links or not, I think the problem has been addressed. And it's, it's, some institutions are reliable and have long-term plans, like, for example, Biblioteca Nacional in Spain, but others are less professional, and it's very difficult to, to make plans on that. But it was just unavailable for, for very many people at the time that we were putting the dictionary together. A lot of uh, the sources have settled out since, but at that time, it was very hard for us to get that information. It's true. And, and that actually, the policy has varied somewhat from time to time. I know that within uh, the American piece of Maribor, that was one of the things that we weren't including in many articles. I think bigger articles were more, were more stable uh, archives that had finding aids and things like that could be included. But, uh, Summaries, you know, saying the principal repositories for the magazine. 
this kind of thing. Uh, because because it's, it, it, it is, although the history marches on, it also expands at the same time. So we have to deal with this question of applying uh, in a sensible and manageable way. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Then let me take it. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists.